but it's uh, an even greater privilege uh, to be able to introduce Danny Gordis tonight. Um, I could go through the normal uh, set of uh, introductions, but there are much more important things to say. So Danny has been my teacher and my mentor in so many ways. Uh, he understands things about the Jewish people and Jewish destiny and the Jewish future that no one else can describe with such articulate beauty. Um, uh, he's an amazing person, um, and he's here tonight with his equally amazing daughter, Talia, who's terrific. Um, you know, I just read, uh, uh, this is about Danny's book, but I'll mention another book. It's called uh, The People in the Books, um, which is an amazing book also. And what it does is it takes a look at 18 books and talks about the themes that tie them together and the, and the, and the debate that goes on internally in every single one of these books about questions that none of us can completely answer. What is the God of Israel? What does it mean to be part of the people of Israel? Um, what does it mean to love the land of Israel? And what does the Torah of Israel have to do with all of these things? This is what's amazing about Danny, is that he has an in-depth, not just an in-depth knowledge, but a deep feeling about each of these things. He started out as a great Jewish scholar. He moved to Israel and understands Israel better than anyone I know, as well as anyone understands it who uh, has three children who've been in special units in the IDF. I've seen Danny as he worries about his kids coming home from battle, coming home from where they are in the IDF. A parent and a Jew and an Israeli whose heart is filled with his love of his people and love of the land of Israel, who understands how the Torah of Israel informs what we feel about the land of Israel, who understands how this notion that we all try to escape talking about, the God of Israel. He wrote an unbelievable book about it um, called God is Not in the Fire, which I highly recommend, along with his new book on Israel, which is also wonderful. If, if there's a person who's going to be able to pull together what we need to know at this time of gigantic crisis, at this time of crisis in the United States and in Israel, who can understand and pull those ideas together, it's Danny Gordis and the institution that he leads, the Shalem College, which has the remarkable goal of actually trying to understand and create a Jewish civilization in the land of Israel. No one smarter, no one better than Danny Gordis. Thanks, Barry. Uh, my only regret is that only one of my kids was here to hear that. Um, and I, I fear that she will not pass it along. But in any event, it's really, a, it's really a great honor to be in this group. This is an extraordinary group of leaders for what is clearly one of the country's great federations. And uh, it's a room filled with many friends and people that I also look forward to getting to know. So to all of you, to Barry and to your staff and to your colleagues, um, my, my really great, great thanks for the invitation to be here tonight and for your role in actually uh, rolling out the book. Uh, this is actually in a certain way, I just got here today to, the, to Israel, my first time in the, uh, to the States, I forget where I am. Um, I just got to the States this morning and it's the first time I've been in the States since the book came out a week or two ago. So this is really the, um, for me at least, the rollout of the book in a certain way. And it's really appropriate that it happened not only in Boston, uh, but that it happened at an event in which uh, CJP is so central and in which Barry is so central. Because it is literally not hyperbolic or in any way an exaggeration uh, to say that the book is a book that exists because of Barry. I mean, Barry is the one that gave him the idea of writing the book without knowing that he was doing it, uh, more on which in a second. Uh, but the book, um, which I'll talk about in a little while, is an attempt to try to reframe and recast the conversation about Israel. And I think it's, it, there could not be a better setting for talking about the book than in a group of people devoted to the leadership of CJP. Because that's what CJP has really long been about. There is no federation in the country that understands the way this federation does. The centrality of Israel to the soul of the Jewish people and to the future of the Jewish people. And there's no federation in the country that understands the way that this federation does, that if we're going to make it our business to have another generation of young Jews care and feel about the Jewish state, that business as usual is just not going to work. 
And nobody is as creative or as strategic or as forward-thinking about education and about Israel and about Israel education. Israel education is, as is the CJP and as are you as its leadership. Uh, it's really a model for people all across the country. Uh, it's really truly inspiring for those of us who work in other kinds of fields to watch what you're doing, uh, which makes it all the more an honor for me uh, to be here tonight. And since Barry was kind enough to mention Shalem College, which is sort of what I do on a day-to-day -day basis, I will actually point out that it's not accidental, I think, that Shalem has found such an extraordinary group of supporters in Boston, of all places, uh, be precisely because this is a community that is so strategic and that is so clear-headed that understands that it's actually forging young leadership and rethinking the question of why Israel matters. We're doing it in one way as a liberal arts college for Israelis. Uh, you're doing it in a different way for people of all different ages in the Boston community and far beyond. Uh, but it really is in many ways both a kind of a figurative partnership uh, because, but because also of the people in this room who have been so helpful and supportive of us, a very real physical partnership uh, as well. So here's how the book came to be. I was uh, sitting at my desk minding my own business, as I always do, and uh, about two or three years ago, I guess three years ago, Bar you know, Ping Outlook shows me a little thing. An email has come in from Barry Schrag. So of course that one I read right away, and he says, I'm bringing a group of people to Israel Maybe some of you were on the trip, I don't know. And he says, I want to give them a book to read about Israel. Here's the criteria, he said. It can't be one of these long, endless tomes. It's got to be academically and intellectually sustainable. It's got to be correct. Um, it ought to be a fun read, a little bit inspiring. I just can't find anything. And I wrote him back and said, by the end of the day, I will get you a name. So there had to be something. This had to be. So, of course, you know, you have thousands and thousands of dollars of equipment all over your, over your table. You take a five-cent little yellow stick'em thing, um, and you put it on your monitor, and it says, you know, deal with Barry before you go home. I'm sure many of you have written exactly that note to yourselves, because you know that it's just not pretty if you don't do that. And um, so at the end of the day, I kind of looked through my shelves, which have more than a few books about Israel. And actually, there are some amazing one-volume histories of Israel but they are really unbelievably long. Howard Sackers, which is a classic, is 1,200 pages. Uh, Sir Martin Gilbert, which is also phenomenally good, is about eight or 900 pages. Anita Shapira's, which came out a few years ago, is about twice as long as mine. Uh, so first of all, they're all very long. None of them are terribly fun, I would say. And more importantly, since Howard Sackers came out more than 40 years ago, not a single one has been written by an American. I think it's an extraordinary thing to think about that for a second that it's been 40 years since anybody in the American Jewish community saw fit to try to tell the story of Israel. Now, it's true that I live in Israel, but I'm obviously, you know, American-born. People say in Israel, you know, English is so good. I say, well, I watch a lot of television. But, um, <laughs> you know, I did actually spend some time in the States. And uh, so I'll call myself American for this particular piece. I think it's actually unbelievable and actually very, very telling that in 40 years, no one in the American community, no one in the American Jewish community has seen fit to say somebody ought to write this book and tell this book. So when I couldn't find anything on my shelves, I did what everybody else does, I went onto Amazon and started looking around. It's just not there. And within five minutes, I knew that the next book that I wanted to do, I was then finishing up the Begin biography, uh, the next book that I wanted to do was the book that Barry couldn't find. What's the book going to do? For me, the most important and the most interesting part of writing the book was to ask the question of, what's this story a story of? When you tell the story of the state of Israel, what's the story about? People read books, and then you, somebody else asks you, well, what's it about? You gotta be able to say, it's about this or it's about that. When you read a story of Israel, what's the story about? And here's the reason that we have lost the battle over Israel's narrative. And it is a battle that we have lost terribly and continue to lose worse each and every day. We're losing it on campuses. We're losing it in congregations. We're losing it all across this country. We've lost it in European parliaments. We've lost it at the UN. We have lost the battle over Israel's narratives because we have allowed the narrative to be shaped almost exclusively by the conflict. You say something to anybody about Israel, wake them up in the middle of the night and do a Rorschach test, you say Israel, they're going to say conflict. You say Israel, they're going to say Palestinians. You say Israel, they're going to say Iran. You say Israel, they're going to say occupation. But you wake them up or you shake them or you talk to them in the middle of the day or in the middle of campus, wherever you find them, and you say Israel, they say something about the conflict. 
And when you ask people what are the great milestones in the story of Israel, what they'll tell you were 1948, 1956, 1967, 1973, and on and on and on. And we don't really have anything to say to counter that. Because those are actually critically important days. They're critically important events. They actually each in their own way shape Israel in different kinds of ways. But it's a story that says that fundamentally what Israel is is the country at war. And young people don't want anything to do with a country that's defined as being a country at war. And what defining Israel in terms of its major military encounters says is that Israel is a country which stands for nothing else other than its battles with the peoples who surround it. No one else wants that. Imagine that people were talking about what America is really all about. People are actually talking about what America is all about. <laughs> and I actually want to thank you, not only for your support of CJP, but I want to thank all of you collectively, because for years I've been coming across this, the ocean back and forth and back and forth, and I'm always afraid somebody's going to say something nasty about our political system. Then I get very self-conscious. Not self-conscious anymore. <laughs> so really just want to thank you. I was actually talking to Howard Dean about six months ago. It was still, I guess, primary season or whatever it was. And Howard and I were talking, and he says, I can't imitate his accent, but he says, you know, you all have a crazy political system. And I just looked at him. And he goes, well, well, oh, okay, okay, okay. Um, so just keep this up as long as you possibly can, because we're feeling quite good. Um, but in seriousness, let's say I wanted to have a conversation about what's America about. I mean, America stands for something. Somebody says, tell me what are the great ideas, why our founding fathers created this country. And then my answer goes, well, there was a war in 1776. I'm going to skip a few. There was a war in 1812. There was a civil war between 62 and 65. There was a First World War. There was a Second World War. There was the Korean War. There was the Vietnam War. There was Iraq. There was Afghanistan, and so on and so forth. Those are all very important dates. Yes, those are all very important dates. But what in the world do they tell you about what America is about? Absolutely, positively nothing. To be sure, because America stands for certain things, some of those wars had to be fought. And because America had made certain grave mistakes, some of those wars had to be fought even internally. But at the end of the day, knowing about 76 and 1812 and the Civil War and so on and so forth doesn't tell you what America is about. It doesn't tell you what's the soul at the heart of this extraordinary republic. To know that, you have to read the Federalist Papers. To know that, you have to read Thomas Jefferson's last public letter written two weeks before he died, 50 years after the republic was founded in which he reflects on what the Declaration of Independence, he thought, would do for all of humanity. To know that, you have to read Martin Luther King's letter from the Birmingham jail. To know what America is about, you have to know a lot of things that have nothing to do with its wars and everything to do with its sense of the human being, everything with its sense of what it is to be a society redeemed. What I wanted to try to do in the book, because I think it's critical for us to take this battle back into our own terms, it's critical for us to redefine the conversation. What I wanted to do in the book was to say Israel is not a country about a war. Israel is not a country about a conflict. To be sure, Israel is a country mired in conflict. And reasonable minds in this room can and do differ about what Israel has done and what Israel is doing and what Israel should do. Those are all very legitimate, complex, very often painful conversations. But that's not what Israel is about. The book that I wanted to write was a book that tells Israel's story differently. And the question again is, what is that story? What I want to suggest for you tonight is that the story of the state of Israel is the story of the Jewish people trying to reinvent and reimagine itself. That's what Israel is. Israel is the Jewish people saying, no more. Something had to change. And we're going to start the story not in 1897 with the first Zionist Congress in Basel, but we can start the story in 1882. And in 1882, a young kid, 19 years old, writes a poem. His name is Chaim Nachman Bialik. And he publishes his first poem and becomes an instant sensation all across the Jewish world. It's a poem called El Atzipor, to the bird, in which he speaks wistfully to a bird that he has imagined has just settled on his windowsill in Eastern Europe, having come from the warmer climes of the Mediterranean and the Middle East and so on and so forth. And he speaks to the bird in a relatively, you know, it's not two stanzas, it's about seven or eight stanzas, but he speaks to the bird and he says, tell me, does the dew still fall like pearls on Mount Hermon? 
a phrase that Bialik learned from the Bible. Does God still have mercy on Zion? He asks the bird, quoting again from the Bible. And he says, tell me, do things, do the calamities that happen here happen there also? This 19-year-old kid becomes an overnight sensation because the Jewish world discovers that he has the ability in a short few lines to convey the anguish, the exhaustion, the almost exasperation of Jews all across the world. Because the late 1880s were not pretty in Europe. And Jews understood that they had no idea how bad it was going to get. Jews understood, or many of them at least, that Europe, for all of its emancipations, was not becoming infinitely more hospitable to Jews. And those with some semblance of history of Jewish, of, of Jewish history knew that the Jews had always kind of lived tentatively. They lived conditionally. They lived in a certain place until that other place didn't want them anymore. In 1290, the British decided, the English decided that they didn't want the Jews. And in 1290, the Jews were gone. Not most of them, but all of them. In 1492, the Spanish decided that they didn't want the Jews anymore, and the Jews could either convert or leave or be burned at the stake. By the late 1800s, it's clear to people like Bialik, speaking to this bird, something has to change. How long are we going to live just hoping that they don't wake up one day and decide that they don't want us again? 1897, Theodore Herzl captures that spirit and transforms it into a political movement. It's a year after he wrote almost a long pamphlet, more than a short book, called the Judenstaat, the Jewish State. And his friends convince him that it's become such a popular book translated into seven languages in the space of one year. They say, you got to have a conference to pull this together. And when Jews gather in Basel in 1897 to begin, as Herzl says, to lay the foundation stone for the future home of the Jews, they actually have a sense that they are transforming Jewish history simply by virtue of meeting, because it's been 2,000 years since Jews from all across the world gathered in one room to do anything. Until Herzl convened the first Zionist Congress, Jews were pods of people. They were in Yemen, and they were in Iraq, and they were in France, and they were in the United States, and they were in Palestine. They were all over, but they never did anything together. They didn't speak the same language. They didn't worship very much the same way. They believed in different kinds of things. It was Herzl, the secular, not terribly knowledgeable, but passionately and devotedly committed Jew who actually brings them all together. And he gets up, as I said a minute ago, in 1897, and he announces, today we are here in Basel, Switzerland, to lay the foundation stone for the home that will eventually house the Jewish people. And 20 years later, in 1917, the British Empire issues the Balfour Declaration, in which it says that His Majesty's government looks with favor upon the creation of a, nat of a, Jewish home, a national home for the Jewish people in Palestine. It's 20 years. It's nothing from a bunch of Jews getting together in a hotel in Basel to the emerging great power of the world actually saying that it gets behind the project. Bialik had written that poem in 1882, kind of longingly speaking to a bird, kind of, you know, almost romantically imagining a land far away. Bialik's tone, though, is going to change dramatically just about 20 years after he writes that poem, slightly more. Because in 1903, not that long after the first Zionist Congress, not that long after the dawning of the 20th century, when reason was supposed to have taken over and the ancient hatreds of the, 1900s, of, the, of the 19th century were supposed to have given way, in 1903 there's a pogrom once again, this time in Kishinev. And the Historical Society of Odessa sends Bialik, who's by now internationally renowned, and they send him to Kishinev to find out what happened. How does this happen again at the beginning of the 20th century? Now, they sent a poet, not a historian. So what they got was not a report. What they got was a poem. But interestingly enough, they got a poem that condemned not the attackers, not the Cossacks. They got a poem that condemned the Jews. They got a poem that accused the Jews for the program. 
The narrator of the poem is led from place to place, and a kind of a docent says, here's what happened here, here's what happened there, and then takes the person down to a cellar and says, here in the cellar is where the women of this community were flung to the floor by the heathen beasts, as Bialik calls them, and violated one after another time and time again, again, using Bialik's language. And then Bialik says, the sister in front of the son, the wife in front of the husband, the daughter in front of the father, all of these people are horribly violated in the worst possible way imaginable in front of their family members. And yet, despite the horror of the attack, Bialik does not vent his venom through his pen at the attackers. He actually spot, shines the spotlight on the Jewish men who are during this attack, he said, hiding, hiding behind a little slatted wall. They're hiding, praying, he says, literally in his poem, to God, save my skin this day. And at that moment, Biali calls them in the poem, Bnei Maccabim, the children of the Maccabees, as which to say, the Maccabees got rid of the Greeks, and you can't fight off a dozen attackers? You are weak, and you should be ashamed. But more than you should be ashamed because you're weak, you should be ashamed because you're cowards. Because real men do not hide while their wives are raped. Real men, even if they're going to get killed in the process, step out from behind that wall and they defend the people they most care about. And you don't even have that. And then Bialik describes a scene which probably is fictional, but it doesn't matter. He's not writing history. This is if you were to read, I don't know, Macbeth or King Lear and say, did that really happen? It misses the point entirely. Shakespeare had something to say, and so did Bialik. And Bialik says the men step out from behind this wall finally when the attackers are gone, and the women, still alive of course, are lying broken bodied and broken in spirit on the floor, and the Kohanim, the priestly class among them, step out and run to the rabbi to ask, tell me rabbi, is my wife still permitted to me? Because in halachic terms, if a priest, a Kohen, is married to a woman who has sex with somebody else, he's no longer allowed to sleep with her. And Bialik, whether again, that probably didn't happen, but it doesn't matter. Bialik's making a point. You know, those little romantic pictures that you have of the Talmudic student in Eastern Europe huddled over a Talmud in the dark yeshiva. Imagine Rembrandt for a second. Bialik says there's nothing romantic about it at all. This Jewish way of life has become a cancer that is eviscerating your soul. You're weak, you're cowards, and you can't even feel. And what Bialik says, having moved from this kind of longing, almost romantic conversation with the bird in 1882, to this fury at Eastern European Jewish men in 1904 when he writes that poem is, Zionism is going to be about changing this. We are going to invent a new Jew. That's what we're going to do. And when David Ben-Gurion on May 14th, 1948, stands in front of that plenum, and we've all seen the videos, and we've all heard the recording, and we've seen the pictures, and he stands there with his head uncovered, he's making a statement. Shimon Peres was a completely secular person, and his family is completely secular, but if you watched the funeral a few weeks ago, you saw his family were all wearing kippot. Because they don't have the same anger that that previous generation did, which is to say, we want nothing to do with where we came from. And what emerges in Zionism between, let's say, 1904 and more or less today, what emerges in Zionism is a fascinating, powerful, complicated, nuanced conversation about how do we redeem the Jew? That's the question at the heart of the state of Israel. When you look at what seems to be rough and tumble Israeli politics between parties, what you're looking at is, among other things, competing visions of what should it mean to be a Jew now in the 21st century, because there were different ideas. Aleph Dalit Gordon said you redeem the Jew by sending her or him out into the land. The Jew should go to sleep with the earth of Palestine under their fingernails, and if we get the Jews to work the land, we're going to redeem the Jew. Max Nordau spoke about Musul Yudin. We need Jews who are not weaklings. We need Jews who are built. And those old Zionist posters of these guys who are really very angular and so on and so forth is part of that vision. Achara Am said we don't even need a state. 
What you need is a kind of, from Zion shall come forth Torah. You need a kimitzion te Torah. You need a kind of a spiritual center in Zion. And he says the Jews should go to two places, a spiritual center in Zion and a much more successful economic center in America. He says that explicitly almost a century ago. Theodore Herzl says, that's ridiculous. A spiritual center is going to do us no good. What we actually need is a country. But Theodore Herzl had a vision in which everybody was going to get along. Jews, Arabs, Christians, it didn't make any difference. Everybody was going to get along kind of singing Kumbaya in the Judean hills. And said Jev Dapatinsky, you're out of your mind. The only reason you can think that is because you don't respect Arabs enough. Because Arabs have as much love for their land as we have for our land. Why do you think that by bringing better clinics, which is exactly what Herzl said, by bringing better clinics and getting fresh water and, and expanding the electricity grid and doing all the things that you want, they're going to what, fall in love with you and they're going to become card-carrying members of the Zionist Organization of America or life members of Hadassah? They're not going to do that, said Jabotinsky. And if you want to stay in that land, be prepared to build what Jabotinsky called in 1923 an iron wall. Because until they understand that attacking you, they're going to hit an iron wall, this thing is never going to end. This conflict is never going to end. And what you have in Zionism is not an ideology. What you have in Zionism is a cacophony and a chorus and a conversation. Between Aleph Dalit Gordon saying going back to the land and Max Nordau saying become Muslim Juden. Between Achana Am saying forget statehood, build a spiritual center. And Theodor Herzl saying, obviously earlier on, he dies in 1904, but Theodor Herzl saying, build a country, and then Jabotinsky saying, build a country, but don't delude yourself that you're going to have peace at any time in the near future. This is exactly what the world is all about. This is what the Zionist world is all about. This is what the conversation is all about. And very little of that is about the conflict. The conflict really erupts in 1929 in the Hebron riots, at which point Zionism is already a robust conversation. And here's where we are in 2016. Wake somebody up in the middle of the night and say, Israel, and all they think about is the conflict. Talk to a college student on a campus and say, Israel, and all they can tell you is occupation. We have allowed the great conversation and the great story that was Zionism to be taken completely off stage. And then instead, we have allowed someone to substitute an important part of Israel's story and a tragic part of Israel's story, but something which is not nearly all of Israel's story. That's the conversation that we have to shift. That's the narrative that we have to recraft. Because nobody in their right minds wants to dedicate themselves to a country that's all about a conflict. Nobody in their right mind wants to go out there and support a country that stands for nothing other than what they call occupation. Who would want that? And yet, we simply don't tell our story. We simply don't tell the story of Zionism as the liberation movement of the Jewish people. That's exactly what it is. And you know why it sounds strange that we say Zionism is the liberation movement of the Jewish people? It sounds strange because when we say a national liberation movement, we think of something that hasn't yet succeeded. But Zionism succeeded. And so Israel seems to a younger generation as natural and as permanent as the rising of the sun. How wrong they are. But the national liberation and movement of the Jewish people was unbelievably successful. Mentioned before that between 1897 and 1917 is 20 years. Between Theodor Herzl getting up in his top hat and tails in a hotel in Basel, Switzerland, and the British Empire recognizing the idea of a national home in Palestine for the Jewish people, a mere 20 years, or I'll give you a different set of dates, almost exactly 20 years. Think for a moment of those images that you have of what's left of Jews staggering out of Auschwitz in January 1945 when it's liberated. I mean, those people are alive, but that's not what alive looks like. And when you see those pictures, you invariably see then the pictures of the Allied troops bulldozing bodies and bodies and bodies into big pits because it's the only sanitary thing to do. And you see those people who are not dead yet many of whom will die shortly thereafter, tragically, in these now ridiculously oversized striped pajamas, whatever you want to call them, uniforms, because there's nothing left to them. They're all bones. 1945, the image of the Jew in Auschwitz is of a complete victim scarcely holding on to life. Fast forward 22 years. 
and you're in June 1967 with the image of those three Israeli paratroopers moving through and Israel as a whole in six days, tripling its size in a defensive war that it didn't want to fight, getting the Golan, the West Bank, Jerusalem, Gaza, the Sinai, and so on and so forth. Zionism has transformed the condition of the Jewish people completely. But the problem with today's younger generation, which you understand in ways that most communities don't, is that they think it was always like that. They don't know that in the lifetimes of their grandparents, actually, just in the lifetime of their grandparents, there were ships sailing the seas filled with Jews that had nowhere on the planet to reach shore. The St. Louis set sail from Hamburg with seven, 800 people on board, every single one of them had bought a legitimate legal visa to Cuba. When they get off of shores of Cuba, Cuba decides not interested. They head north. They're within 90 nautical miles of the shores of the United States of America. And the Roosevelt administration says, we're not interested either. And after a long saga, the details of which we won't go into and now, the St. Louis makes its way back to Germany. And between a quarter and a third of the people on that boat who were 90 miles away from American shores will go up the chimneys of gas chambers. The Struma set sail from Romania in 1943 for what's supposed to be a three-day sail, just under 900 people on board and eight toilets. The engine breaks. It's in the Istanbul harbor for weeks on end. The Turks don't want Jews. They're a, a day's, they're a day's sail away from Palestine. The Turks call the British and say, one boat. What do you care, one boat? The British say, no boats. The United States calls the British and says, what are you doing? The British say, what did you do? Nobody wants this boat. The Turks won't even send food and water onto the boat. The local Jewish community of Istanbul takes care of that. At the end of the day, when the Turks say we need the berth in the harbor, the boat is towed back up to the Bosphorus into the Black Sea, left there without a motor. The Soviets don't want anybody drifting towards their side of the Black Sea. They send a submarine and fire a torpedo at it. The boat sinks, one person survives. He died about two years ago in Oregon. But the rest of them are dead. Not because they were involved in a war, but because they were Jews. And in the lifetimes of many of the people sitting in this tent tonight, in the lifetimes of many of the people sitting here, there was no place on earth for Jews to go. And what Israel has done is it has transformed that reality so completely that young Jews don't really believe it ever existed. It has transformed the image of the passive, victimized Jew so completely that to young people today, it sounds like ancient history or like a very bad fairy tale. And what we've lost is the robust, intellectually rich, morally profound conversation that Zionists have been having for a very long time about how Jews should recreate a society which is not a simple business. There is an occupation going on, and what to do about it is a source of great concern to Israelis and to American Jews. And reasonable minds can and do differ, and there are exactly zero good solutions. Exactly zero. So do you continue the status quo? Do you do something different? Again, reasonable minds can differ. But this is not the first profound, painful conversation that Zionism has had. Zionism has had previous conversations about religious or secular, socialist or free market. Fundamentally European in its origins or in its outlook or in its narrative? Or do you include Yemen and Iraq and Iran and all those North African countries? We've been debating what Israel should be and what the Jew of the 20th and 21st century should be for a very long time. We've been having a profound and robust conversation about what an ideal Jewish society should look like for almost 100 years. And most young people, when you say to them, Israel, think occupation. And you know whose fault that is? That's our fault. Because nature abhors a vacuum, and you don't tell a different story, the story that others tell will simply fill the space. And people ask, you know, often, and with this I'll conclude, people ask often, so, you know, what do you want the book to do? So, you know, you're tempted to say, be bought by one out of every three people in India, or something, <laughs> you know. There is my retirement right there. But that's not going to happen, and that's really completely unimportant to me. 
What do you want the book to do? Want the book to first of all be seen as fair. That people on the left can read it and say, I don't agree with everything in it, but that, I can see that. And people on the right to read it and say, I certainly don't agree with everything with that, but it's a book that I can at least get into. I can have this conversation. And if that can happen, and then the left and the right can meet and have a conversation about Israel for the first time instead of screaming at each other, that'll be an accomplishment. And if we can actually take back the night, so to speak, if we can take back the conversation, if we can take back the narrative, and begin to get people talking about Israel, talking about the great ideas that have long been at the core of Zionism, and the great ideas that I believe are still very much at the core of the richness of the Israeli conversation, I think what we're going to show people is that this is a story that is perhaps the greatest human drama in all of history. A people on the very, very precipice, who given an opportunity to second lease on life, do simply unbelievable things. Literally do, I know we say it too much, but literally do make the desert bloom. Literally do go from a place in which there were no pipes and no cranes in 1949 to a high-tech power known worldwide. Go from a place that in 1950s had food rationing to a place that now makes, you know, award-winning wines and all of that kind of stuff. Transform completely the image of the Jew from that person struggling and staggering out of Auschwitz to the three paratroopers in June 1967 and much, much, much more. If in some small way the book helps bring people back to a conversation about that kind of Israel, an Israel which also faces very serious challenges and dilemmas, then it seems to me that the book will have been, at least, for me at least, some bit of a success by engendering the kind of conversation that we need to have. And I'll just finally conclude by saying once again that for me at least, uh, it's personally a delight and an honor uh, if there is an official rollout to have the rollout in Boston and to have the rollout among the leadership of the CJP. Because there is no organization as strategic and there is no organization as vision driven and there is no organization as deeply and profoundly committed to Israel's centrality but in a smart way as the CJP and as its lay and professional leadership. What you do is a model not only to Jews across Boston and the farther reaches of this area, what you do is actually a model to Jews all across the country and indeed Jews all across the world. And if we together, each of us in our own way, can do what you've been doing under Barry Schrag's leadership now, leadership now for almost three decades, which is to redefine the Jewish conversation and to redefine the conversation about Israel. I think subsequent generations will look back at you and the work that you did and say, whatever else may have happened out there, the people in this tent tonight knew what was important and the people in this tent tonight did what they needed to do in order to ensure that the greatest days of the Jewish people lay not in the past, but in a glorious future still ahead. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm told that we have some time for questions while they're setting up breakfast. And um, <laughs> sushi for breakfast, it can't be that bad. It's, it's got vegetables, starch, it's a food group. Uh, but in any event, I'm saying, I understand we have a few minutes for questions. I'll get a signal when it's time to stop. Uh, but in the it's a little hard to see you guys out there. But um, if there are questions, there are people roaming around with mics. And uh, uh, there is a. There's a hand here, I assume it's attached to a person. Uh, that's good, much healthier that way. Thank you very much. Does the Israeli government recognize the thesis that you've articulated so beautifully? And if so, why don't they articulate it? Um, does the Israeli government articulate what I've been talking about? Absolutely, I mean, Bibi calls me every morning and uh, <laughs> You know, we chat about Sarah and the kids, and uh, I ask him how many cans his wife has collected and how many bottles my wife has collected. It's really very special. Uh, actually, in all seriousness, a lot of Israelis understand this. 
a lot of Israelis really do understand this, and there's an unbelievable cadre of really vision-driven Israelis who are running exceptional educational programs, whether they are what's called the Mechinot Kedam Tzvayot, which are these pre-army Mechina programs for that are really run by, I think, among Israel's very best educators. There are youth movements that are doing this. Obviously, Barry was kind enough before to mention Shalem, which is an unabashedly, non-embarrassed to say it, profoundly Zionist liberal arts college with everybody across the political spectrum, with everybody all the way across the religious spectrum, across the socioeconomic spectrum, across the gender spectrum, I mean, you name it. But everybody understands it's a profoundly, it's, a, it's, a, it's an institution deeply and profoundly committed to serious Zionist thinking. So there is a lot of people in Israel who I think, you know, are doing it much better than I am and saying it much more articulately than I am and know a lot more than I do. Government-wise, I actually think we're failing. And um, this is not a dig specifically at Bibi, because I think one could have said it about prime ministers who came before him, and one may be able to say it about prime ministers who come after him. Um, but my, my big gripe with Bibi is, I have a lot of gripes with Bibi, and that's not for breakfast, that's till lunch. But, um, but my main gripe with him is not about, you know, peace process, people can disagree, and you know, now we're debating the, uh, the broadcast authority this week, you can talk about that, you can talk about the gas deal, Israel's a complicated place. Thank God your country's simple. But, um, but my main beef with Bibi is that next to David Ben Gurion, he's the longest serving prime minister in Israeli history. And in about two years, he'll pass Ben Gurion. And here's what I challenge anybody in the room to do whether you love him or hate him is irrelevant. Find me in his written or oral corpus a profound vision of the state of Israel, a vision which has at its core a substantive, nuanced, thought through, rooted conception of what is Jewish about the Jewish state that is more than caving into religious parties? What is Bibi Netanyahu's conception of what the Jewish state should be? I have absolutely no idea. And that to me is his greatest failing. David Ben-Gurion was a very, very, very flawed leader. He was also probably, as Yitzhak Navon, Israel's fifth president, once said, the greatest Jew who ever lived since King David. I mean, Navon was not given easily to hyperbole, and he said that about Ben-Gurion. Without Ben-Gurion, there'd be no state. That's 100% that's clear. And yet Ben-Gurion had many, 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 many faults. But he had a profound vision for what the Jewish state should be. It was, it was ex extremely secular. It was dismissive of religious people. It did not take into consideration enough the Jews of North African countries. It was excessively elitist and intellectual. There was a lot of things wrong with it, but it was a profound Jewish vision. It was something you could argue about. And I think what we need in our next leadership, when it, whether it comes tomorrow or in five years, whenever, it kind of doesn't matter so much left or right, and it kind of doesn't matter so much where they stand on this or where they stand on that, although obviously these policies all matter a great deal. What I want from our next leader and who I'll vote for is somebody who gets up at a podium somewhere and says something that makes me think that when they're on the treadmill or they're in the shower or they're swimming their laps, they're actually thinking about what's going to make this country Jewish enough that it's worthy of the name Jewish state in a way that allows it also to be modern and Western and democratic and so on and so forth. When I see a profound vision like that, that person gets my vote. Um, and I think, frankly, that the current government, again, you can like its policies or not like its policies, but even if you love its policies, I think you have to acknowledge that it has not articulated that vision, and I think that's a very serious shortcoming. I'm also not running for anything, so it's... Um, what do you say to the many people, uh, especially on college campuses, but also maybe in this tent, uh, who say that the Jewish state shouldn't be Jewish? Wrong. Um, you know, I, I want to quote, you know, I try to stay abreast. I try to stay abreast of how you guys speak. So, um, you know, we do, have, we do have television in Israel, tragically. And, um, well, they're wrong. Uh, here's what I would say. The Jewish state shouldn't be Jewish. Well, if it shouldn't be Jewish, it shouldn't exist because the cost is ridiculously high. Cost is ridiculously high. So if it's not going to be Jewish, let's just fold up shop and go home. Then there's a few questions you have to ask yourself. Do you really believe that human history has changed so much that the Jews do not need a place to call refuge? I don't believe that for a second. I mean, I can tell you, I live in, in Baca, 
which some people say is the neighborhood in the southern part of Jerusalem, and some people say is the 51st state. They're not actually mutually exclusive. It's a very heavily Anglo neighborhood. Uh, it's a nice place to live. It's now increasingly French. And when you take a walk on Shabbat afternoon alongside those railroad tracks that the British laid not that long ago, you hear French. You hear a lot of English, you hear Hebrew, you hear some Russian, you hear a lot of Arabic when you walk through Beit Safafa, the Arab village right next door to Baca, more or less. But you hear a lot of French. Not because the French are great Zionists, which they actually are. Because the Jews are fleeing, are fleeing Europe again. So I think it takes a person of extraordinary historical obtuseness to suggest that given what's going on with the Labour Party in England, and given what's going on in France, and please do not ignore the alt-right community in the United States, the David Duke stuff that gets ignored for a few days, everybody gets the point until there's a finally a disavowal. There's things that are scary about the condition of the Jew in Europe, in the United States, whatever. So the first thing that I would say is this. The Jewish people actually should not take for granted Jewish safety. Jewish safety is never as permanent as we imagine it is. The Jews of Berlin in 1932 were convinced that they had come home. I wrote my doctoral dissertation. If you have trouble sleeping tonight, call me. I'll read it to you. Um, it's better than a box of Ambien. But I wrote my doctoral dissertation on a rabbinic figure in Germany named David Zvi Hoffman. He was the chief rabbi of Germany until his death in 1921. And uh, he's asked during the First World War a question by a young man who says, basically, I've been drafted by the German army. I have a way of evading the draft. He doesn't say in the letter what it is, but he has a way. He says, and I know if I go to the army, I'm going to have to violate Shabbat, I'm going to violate Chagim, I'm going to have to eat non-kosher food, so I can get away, what should I do? And Hoffman writes back, it's not dated, but it's clearly at some point during the First World War, so you know the parameters. He says, don't you dare evade the German army, because it is in Germany that the Jews have finally found their permanent home. The last thing that the Jews can afford to do is to insult the country that has welcomed us like no other. When I read that tshuva, I mean, that was, was a long time ago, I'll tell you what my instinctive gut reaction was. My gut reaction was, thank God he died in 1921. And he, no, seriously, and that he didn't live to see how ridiculously myopic that particular piece of his worldview was. So the first thing I would say to people say the Jews don't need refuges, you just don't know the first thing about history, and you don't know the first thing about Jewish history. But beyond that, Israel's much more than a refuge. Israel is the place in which the Jewish people rejoin the stage and rejoin world history as actors, as opposed to victims or objects or passive observers. And I think that just like all great traditions, we have something to say. We have something to say about what a just society looks like. We have something to say about the role of women. Women were running for office and voting in 1898, already at the Second Zionist Congress. It just didn't come up at the first one. It was no negative, just didn't come up. But by 1898, at the Second Congress, there was not a country in Europe in which women had the vote. There was not a country in Europe in which women could run for office. And they were running for office and voting in the Zionist movement. Why is it that gay Palestinians try to sneak across the border to go to Tel Aviv? Because they're Zionists? Or because they just don't want to die? The Jewish, the, the Israeli educational system, the university system starts class after the end of the holidays. So our freshman orientation was last week and this week we started class. So I've been meeting with every single one of our freshmen for a little bit, it takes a few weeks to get through them all, but I've been meeting with every single one. Among the things you ask them is, you know, sort of, what'd you do in the army? And this one did this, this one did that. I was talking yesterday to a kid who was responsible for doing triage for the, the Syrian refugees who are either trying to sneak across the border or being brought across the border for medical treatment. And talked about how petrified some of them were to be in the hands of the evil Israeli Zionist, except that the evil Israeli Zionist doctors actually took the metal out of their bodies and sewed them up and healed their children and then brought them back to Syria. And then the word spread. It's actually not so bad over there. I think we have, we're not perfect. And we have not managed the conflict, the well, I would manage it at least. Not that I have any great solutions, by the way. And we haven't managed Israel, Israel's Arab citizens the way I would manage it. We haven't managed it. it. There are Holocaust survivors living in poverty. It's an abomination. There's abominations in all great societies. 
You think it's not an abomination that an African-American who gets pulled over on the highway five miles from here has to wonder at that moment if she or he is going to get shot? Whereas if any one of us driving home tonight gets pulled over, we just think, damn it, I got a ticket. That's an abomination that people feel that way in the country in 2016. Every great society has things of which to be terribly ashamed, and we do too. But Jews have been talking for thousands of years about we have an ideal vision of society. Israel is where you take the ideas and the Talmud and you try to put them into a parliament. Israel is where you take the ideas out of the Bible and you try to apply them at your border. Israel is, is the place where you take the ideas of Jewish, everybody being created in God's image. It was said so beautifully before. And you ask yourself, how are you treating Holocaust survivors? How are you treating handicapped people? How are you treating people with all kinds of disabilities? That's where the rubber meets the road. And if the Jews want to stay in Yeshivot in Eastern Europe, or wherever they are, in Muncie or in Brooklyn or wherever, they want to stay in Yeshivot and have this Jewish conversation completely unattached from reality, well, that's all good. But I think what makes a tradition real is when the, when the tradition actually has to see if its ideas stand the test of reality. And that can only happen in a place where the expectation of its citizenship is that it's going to be the embodiment of Judaism's best values. People in Boston will vote next week based on what they think Judaism's best values are. But nobody suggests, therefore, that the state of Massachusetts and its assembly should be the embodiment of the values of the Mishnah. That's not its role. It has a different purpose, but the Knesset should. So what I would say to those people who say that the Jewish state shouldn't exist is, A, if it's not Jewish, it's not going to exist because Jews are not going to stay. B, the Jews actually still do need a refuge, but much more importantly, this is where we go from Sinai. Sinai gives you the ideas. The Talmud and medieval Jewish exposition develop those ideas. And the state of Israel from 1948, God willing, for many, many more years to come, is the place where we test those ideas, try to bring them to fruition, and teach the world something that we've been thinking about for a very long time. Thanks very, very much.